All right, so today we're going to take a look at section P.4 polynomials. And to start with, um, we're going to write down this very long and awkward looking um, equation. It's not even an equation, it's an expression right now because there's no equal sign. Um, and I'll explain it here in a moment. What you see is a with a subscript of n, x to the power of n, plus a sub n minus 1, x to the power n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2, x to the power n minus 2, and then I've got all the dot, dot, dots, plus a1, x, plus a0. So that's the basic um, form, not formula, but form of a polynomial. A few details that um, are necessary in order for this to be correct is that the exponents have to be whole numbers. So if you remember from our discussion on the first day of class, whole numbers are the positives, okay, and zero. Um, and they don't have decimals or fractions, anything like that. So no decimals, no fraction exponents, um, whole numbers only. Um, the coefficients, all those a's at the beginning of things, are just real numbers. So while they technically could be like radicals and uh, pi and things like that, they're not usually. Sometimes they're fractions or decimals, but a lot of time they're just positive and negative whole numbers. They're integers. And there's a few things that come apart or come about rather um, as a result of this. Um, one is that there are some polynomials that we see frequently enough um, that they actually have special names. So they're all called polynomials, um, but there's some that are very special um, just because we see them frequently. One of them is if they have one term. So one term just means there's no addition or subtraction. They just have one number followed by one variable with one exponent. And if that happens, it's actually called a monomial. Right? Mono e mono, one to one. So that phrase mono at the beginning, Latin, means one. If you have two terms, it's a binomial. Make sense? Bi means two. Um, you see bicycles, right? Two cycles. If, you're, if you get paid bi-weekly, it means you get paid every two weeks um, like that. So that bi word. Um, and then three is tri, right? Tricycle, trinomial. So anything with more than three, we will always just say polynomial. But you could say polynomial for all of these, actually. other things. This term at the very beginning, I don't think I have a slide specifically about this note, is called the leading coefficient. Um, so if we put them in order from the biggest exponent to the smallest exponent, that's how we typically see them written. We call that descending order of exponents. And if we do that, the first coefficient is called the leading coefficient because it's in front. And then the exponent that happens right here is called the degree. So this one right now has degree n. So the first thing that we're going to do, our first example, is to simply identify degree and leading um, coefficients for a polynomial. So this polynomial has two terms. How do we separate terms? Well, the addition and subtraction separates them. So you can see, right, there's two terms separated right there because there's a subtraction sign between them. So this is a binomial. It's actually got the biggest exponent term first. All right, so it's in that sort of descending order of exponents that we typically will see or that we want to put things into. And that highest degree right here, the highest value of an exponent would be our degree. So our degree is 7. The leading coefficient is simply the coefficient in front of the term that has that highest degree. So 
So what value is in front of the x to the seventh? Yeah, it's a negative one. So you see the negative, you don't see the one, but it's understood to be there. It is a negative one. So the leading coefficient for this polynomial is negative one. Um, later on in the semester, we'll come back to why some of those details are important. Um, basically, um, how they change the graph, what the graph actually does, how does it extend on the ends of the graph, does it go up, does it go down, is it do so very fast or very slow. Those details are specifically determined by the degree and by the leading coefficient. So a lot of what we're going to do in this lesson is simply simplify our polynomials. So we're going to be combining like terms, and we're going to do this with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and we're going to see what happens because it's a little different with division. Um, and like terms we've talked about last time um, are terms that have the same form. So for the purposes of polynomials, the same form means that they have the same variable raised to the same exponent. Now with addition, like on this particular problem, it's very nice because although there are parentheses there, and that's true, when you separate things in parentheses with addition, the parentheses aren't really necessary, right? There are two polynomials. They are added together. But if you think about sort of distributing this plus sign through, it doesn't change anything, right? So there's really sort of no reason to need those parentheses, and we can actually move right through them with a combining or adding of like terms. So the terms that are starting out to be alike, the power of two terms could be combined. I have negative three of them, I have positive five of them. For that, I would get a total of two, right? Audience participation time. It's two x squared, positive three, I'm sorry, negative three and positive five. The next two that are alike happen to be x terms. There are two of those as well. I have negative 4x and negative 8x, which gives me a total of negative 12x. And then I happen to, in this one, they all just, they do match up very nicely, have two constant terms at the end. I have a positive 2 and I have a negative 7, which gives me negative 5. So there's really no work to show. You're just piecewise combining the pieces that go together. Is that good? Okay, so addition, very straightforward. You just combine the pieces that are alike. With subtraction, you do have a little bit of front end work. Um, while you could do the subtraction from where it is, um, you're likely to make a mistake if you do. Um, I would strongly encourage you to at least rewrite the second piece by distributing the negative through. So on this one, the negative will change all the signs inside to be negative because all the signs happen to be positive but they would change them however needed to be changed. So I have negative x squared, I have negative 4x, and I have negative 4. So all the signs get changed. My values at the beginning don't change. They don't have anything out in front of that parentheses. So I'm just going to rewrite them as is. And then I'm back to doing the same thing I did on the last problem. I'm combining like terms. So I have x squared and I have negative x squared. So what happens on that one? Yeah, those add to 0. So I don't need to worry about writing anything on that. I have a positive 2x and a negative 4x. Yep, that's negative 2x. And then I have a positive 4 and I have a negative 4. They cancel out, right? They add to 0. So this one actually sort of collapses all the way down to negative 2x. So just as a reminder in terms of vocabulary, because I'll use the words occasionally, not because I necessarily am going to ask you to identify them, but this is a trinomial. It's got three terms, right? This one would be actually a monomial at the end. There's just one term. There's no addition or subtraction combining it with something else. So we ended up with a monomial at the end. Okay, that's not related to this problem. I just want to throw in the vocab because I am going to use it from time to time and I won't want you to be like, what is she talking about again? So I'm going to try and get you familiar with it if you aren't. On number four, we actually see one where we have multiplication. Um, so there's lots of ways to do multiplication. Um, you might have remembered the phrase FOIL. Who's heard of FOIL before? Okay, great, that's most of you. Um, I had a student teacher um, once do something that was pretty clever. She drew her arrows like this, and she talked about it making a smiley face on the bottom. You see the smiley face? So that's how she drew her arrows, and I thought that was kind of nice. Uh, every now and then, um, I will, depending on the class that I'm working with and the content structure I'm working with, I will set it up as a grid. Has anybody ever seen this done as a grid? So if you do it as a grid, it looks like this. You actually um, 
mark it out like this. And each of the four boxes corresponds to a multiplication factor. So I have like 2y and negative 1. And I have 3y and I have 4. And I multiply inside my grid. That's another way you might have seen it used. Um, you can also just interpret this as actually um, distribution as is. So you take the negative, you take the 2y and you distribute it across here, right? And then you take the negative 1 and you distribute it across here. So because that's the last one I just drew, that's the one I'm going to do. But it doesn't make any difference. It won't give you anything any different no matter which of those ways that you do the problem. So whichever one you're most comfortable, familiar with, um, the one you like the best, whatever, just use that and you'll be fine. So if I think about this as distribution, I'm going to start with my 2y. I would multiply 2y times 3y. So what is 2y times 3y? 6y squared. That 6 looks funky. 6y squared. Uh, 2 times 3 is 6. y times y is y squared. Then I would multiply the 2y times 4. So 2y times 4 is 8y. All right? And now I'm going to do the same thing. I'll change colors just so that I have a distinguishing um, bit here. I have the negative 1, and I'm going to do the same thing by moving it through. So negative 1 times 3y is negative 3y, and negative 1 times 4 is negative 4. So those four pieces will show up when you do your distribution, your foiling, your smiley faces, your um, grid box, whatever. These same four terms will all show up in every single case. And then you combine whichever ones you can, and it's typically the two of them in the middle that get combined. Depends on the order you do things a little bit, but there's typically two that get combined. And so we have 6y squared. There's an 8y and a negative 3y, so that gives me 5y and the negative 4 at the end. Okay, so any questions on that? Now, just because um, on this one we have a binomial times a binomial doesn't mean it has to work out that way all the time. You can see on your next example, this is a binomial, two terms, times a trinomial, three terms. Now, you're going to do the same thing, but like your acronym FOIL doesn't really work because there's not a first, an outer, and an inner, a last, right? Like that's not how it, it sort of displays itself. So that acronym doesn't really pan out for this. Um, you can still do distribution. You can still do boxes. And so I'm going to do that same distribution that I did before. I just have to take my term, in this case x, and I have to distribute it through three terms in the second set of parentheses. So I have x times 3x squared, which is what? 3x cubed. Mm-hmm, 3x cubed. And I have x times negative 5x to give me? negative 5x squared, and finally I have x times 2 for 2x. And then I do the same thing with the second term in this binomial, the negative 3. I'll multiply that negative 3 times all three of the terms in my trinomial. So the negative 3 times 3x squared is? Good, negative 9x squared. Negative 3 times negative 5x gives me? Yeah, and it's positive, right? So 15, positive 15x. And then negative 3 times 2 at the end will give me negative 6. So on the last one, you might sort of notice I had two terms times two terms, right? Binomial times a binomial. I ended up with four terms before I combined them, right? Two times two is four. The same thing happens here in terms of structure. I have two terms times three terms, two times three, six. So I end up with six terms when I multiplied everything out. Okay, so it's, it's a good check step just to make sure you didn't sort of miss something along the way. You should have six terms there. We're going to combine the terms that, of course, are alike. Um, there's only one of them that has an x cubed, so he stands alone with 3x cubed. But I have a couple of places where I have x squared. I have this one, negative 5, and I have this one, negative 9. So if I combine those, what do I get? Mm -hmm, negative 14x squared. 
Um, sort of moving down the line, um, I also have a 2x here and a 15x here. So that's going to be 17x. And then the only thing I haven't dealt with is, again, the loner on the end. That's the negative 6x here, or negative 6, excuse me, here. So it's just negative 6. And that would be my final resulting expression. Any questions on that? Okay, so um, number six is not, it's not really a polynomial in the sense that I have those x to the powers terms, right? I mean, I don't. Um, but I think that your book likes to throw it in with this section because the process by which we multiply it out is the same. So we're going to do the same thing on number six that we did basically over here on number four where I had two terms times two terms. And we're going to combine like terms. I'm just not going to have any variables in it. I'm going to have radicals in it instead, okay? So we're going to take our five and we're going to distribute this through. Or if you want to use FOIL or a box, you can do that. So I have five times four, which gives me 20. And then... <coughs> On the second one, I have 5 times negative 3 square root 2. So anything that's on the outside gets multiplied. So that means that the 5 gets multiplied by the 3, negative 3, to give me negative 15. And if they both had radicals, anything that was under the radical would also get multiplied. The 5 doesn't have that, so the square root of 2 stays square root of 2. And then I'm going to do the same thing with square root of 2. So again, the square root of 2 and the 4, I, I multiply what's on the outside by what's on the outside and what's on the inside by what's on the inside, and actually they don't have anything sort of to multiply. One of them is a 4, which means it's on the outside automatically, so that's plus 4. And one of them is a square root of 2, so that square root of 2 stays underneath the radical automatically as square root of 2. Okay? The last two being multiplied are the most interesting because I have square root of 2 and I have 3 square root of 2. So the 3 stays on the outside, or negative 3, rather. And then I have square root of 2 times square root of 2. So if you wish, you can write that as square root of 4. Or if you recognize it before then, that square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2, you can write that. One way or another, you can't leave it square root of 4, okay? Because square root of 4 can be simplified. So either simplifying it here now or simplifying it sort of in the next step, the square root of 4 is 2, so we will simplify that piece. Now, just for the sake of doing so, um, I'll do it in the two steps. I'm going to rewrite my 20, and I rewrote the 3 times the 2. These two in the middle can be combined, though, because they both have the same form, right, the same structure. They're a coefficient radical 2, coefficient radical 2. So I have negative 15 of them, and I have positive 4 of them. What does that give me? Yeah, negative 11. So I have negative 11 radical 2. So those two pieces can be combined. And after I do that, let me just shift this over because it looks funny, all spread apart. I have 20 here. This is 3 times 2, which is 6, right? And, and it's negative. So I have 20 minus 6, which gives me 14. So we're going to write it as 14 minus 11 square root 2. If you wanted to write it as negative 11 square root 2 plus 14, that would be fine as well. So that's what we would have. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, along the lines, um, well, let me make one comment. Um, you'll notice the first, well, it's two, three, and four. Number two was addition, number three was subtraction, and number four was multiplication. And I mentioned something about division, and we will talk about division. We're not going to do division with polynomials now because that's a really big topic that occurs like in chapter three, I think it is. Okay, so there's a lot more involved than simply something that you would have seen in a simple little operational kind of status. However, we are going to talk about what happens with division when you have radicals. Since we brought radicals back into the picture on number six and sort of showed the same structure, um, we talked about not leaving radicals in the denominator. In fact, one of the questions that you guys started with this morning had a radical in the denominator, and we said, hey, look, radical in the denominator, we're just going to multiply by the radical. Um, and that works just fine when there's not addition or subtraction in the denominator. If there's addition or subtraction in the denominator, that won't be sufficient. 
Because imagine this, if I were, don't write this down because it's not gonna work, but if I were to multiply by square root of eight, I would have to multiply that square root of eight by the three and by the square root of eight. And when I multiplied the three and the square root of eight together, I'd still have a square root of eight in my denominator. So it would be less than helpful, right? So that's not gonna be enough to simply eliminate my radical in my denominator for one that has addition and subtraction in it. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to multiply by the conjugate. So you've probably heard the phrase conjugate before. You may not remember what it means, or you might. But the conjugate is the same thing that's in the denominator. Well, it's not the same thing that's in the denominator. It's the same thing you have in any ter two terms, but with the opposite sign. So the conjugate for the denominator is 3 minus square root of 8. There's a conjugate for the numerator, too. We just don't need it. Okay, so I mean, like, there's a conjugate for the top. It's square root of 2 minus 5. Okay, that's fine. We can do that. But it doesn't matter. So we want the denominator with the opposite sign in the middle. And anything that we multiply the denominator by, we have to multiply the numerator by, right? Like so. Now, that denominator will multiply out, and I won't have any radicals, and I'll show you why. The numerator will still have radicals, generally speaking. So we're not eliminating radicals from everywhere, just like we weren't in the previous section. We're just going to be eliminating them from the denominator. Now, who remembers, I'm not gonna ask you to tell me what it is, but who remembers the phrase difference of squares? Just raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. This is, difference of squares comes up when we talk about factoring. And this idea of conjugates is directly related to difference of squares, if that's something that you remember anything about. Um, so when I multiply this denominator out, we'll do the same thing that we did before. I'm gonna take my three and distribute it. So I have three times three is nine. I'm just working in the denominator for now. And I have three times negative square root of eight, which is negative three square root eight. Okay, multiply the things that are on the outside together, things that are on the inside together, this is what I have. Okay, so far so good? Yes. All right, now I'm gonna multiply the second term, the square root of eight, by the pieces through here. So I have square root of eight times three. Okay, well that's positive three square root eight. And then I will multiply square root of eight times square root of eight, I get just eight. One's positive, one's negative, so it's a negative eight. What do you notice happens in the middle of these four terms? They cancel out, they add to zero, and that will always happen when you multiply by conjugates, always. It eliminates the outer terms and the inner terms if you're thinking about this from a foiling perspective. And in the case of what we're doing right now, it eliminates the radicals specifically. So. In the numerator, that beautiful fact does not happen. Let me shift this down so I have a little bit more space. And let me change this again. Mm, let's try that one. How about the square root 2? So we're going to multiply the square root 2 through. So square root of 2 times 3. 3 is on the outside, so it stays on the outside. Square root 2 stays underneath the radical, or the 2 stays underneath the square root. And then I have the square root of 2 and I have the square root of eight. They're both underneath the radical. One's positive, one's negative, so it is negative. What happens when I multiply two times eight? What do I have? It's 16 square. Yeah, I get square root of 16, which is a perfect square. So if you recognize it and you just wanna write down four right now, that's great. If you don't recognize it, we'll simplify it later. I'm just gonna leave mine square root of 16 for the moment. Now we're gonna do the same thing with the five. So we have this five right here. I've got a lot going on in my picture. How about purple? So we're gonna do the five and we're gonna multiply it through. So I have five times three, that's just 15. And I have five times negative square root of eight, so that's negative, the five's on the outside, and the eight stays underneath the radical. So four pieces on top, four pieces on bottom, but on the bottom, two of the pieces are going to add to zero. So these two add to zero. And in the bottom now, I have nine minus eight. That's very friendly. 
that's going to give me just one. So in some sense, my whole thing is collapsing to have a denominator of one. That does not always happen, by the way. That's just the uniqueness of this particular problem. Usually you still have a denominator. Um, in the top, or on the top, some of these simplify, like we already mentioned, the square root of 16 is 4. Um, we also have some other pieces that are sort of um, interestingly going to simplify. Um, I have my 3 square root of 2, so let me just rewrite that right now. Um, the 4 right here is negative, right? And the 15, so I have negative 4 and positive 15, which is 11. And then at the end, this 5 square root of 8. Let's talk about square root of 8 for a moment. We could have done this at the beginning. It would have been fine if we had. We can also do it at the end. It doesn't really matter. Um, but 8 does divide. It divides into 2 times 2 times 2, right? And with square roots, we're looking for pairs of numbers. There is a pair of 2s that I can pull out of the radical. So I have this minus 5. I can pull out a 2, and I still have a 2 that's underneath. So I will need to multiply the 5 and the 2 because they are now both on the outside, and they will be able to be combined. So there is actually a 10 here. So I have 10 square roots of 2, and I have 3 square roots of 2. So 10 plus, I'm sorry, 10, I'm sorry, 3, and then minus the 10 because it's a negative gives me what? Positive 3, negative 10? Negative, negative 7. Thank you so much. Negative 7 square root of 2. And I have the positive 11. Or you can write it as 11 minus 7 square roots 2, whichever way you like better. So one of those versions would be your final answer because it's divided by 1. Otherwise, we just leave it divided by whatever other number it's divisible by, right? Maybe it's still divided by 7 or something like that. Any questions from P4? Okay, so P4 is assigned. Um, I've had a couple students mention in my classes, and I don't remember if it's this class or my other class, that maybe books have not quite arrived for that specific person or something like that. They've had some trouble getting access. If that's you and you still don't have your book, please let me know so that I can get you the homework for P4, and hopefully your book will be here very soon. But um, just not having the book doesn't mean I'm just not going to do the homework at the moment. I really want you to keep track on track so you don't fall behind.